and welcome back to my channel. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on post notifications so that you never miss a video. Today, we are doing the thing that all of you have been asking. I'm finally doing a regulatory affairs series. But before we get started and I explain what we're gonna talk about today, I just wanna mention that you can still pre-order my book, The Prepared Graduate. It is available everywhere on January 25th. I cannot wait for this book to drop. It's probably the most exciting thing that I've done in my career and I think that writing a book takes a lot of work and I'm appreciative to all of you for inspiring me to write this book in the first place. So link is in the description box if you would like to pre-order The Prepared Graduate. It's not just for college students, it's for anybody at all who's looking to really be a savage in their career. So today, in episode one of my Regulatory Affairs series, we're gonna be talking about the FDA, different application types, as well as common regulatory pathways. In my videos and my vlogs, I talk a lot about what I do, day to day in a few videos I've mentioned working on me quests or preparing for this or working on an IB but I've actually began to realize that you guys might not understand these acronyms that I'm speaking in which is what really inspired me to kick off this series so first things first in this video we're gonna explain what the FDA is who are they we talk so much about the FDA but do we even know what the acronym stands for FDA stands for Food and Drug Administration and their main job is to ensure the safety efficacy and security of human and veterinary products biologics as well as medical devices. They also regulate cosmetics and food. So the FDA is really there to protect the public and that is one of the main reasons why I decided to get my MPH because MPH, Masters in Public Health, is all about ensuring the safety of whatever population you serve but really just the public. And the FDA is one of the most well-known public health government entities that works day in and day out to ensure the safety of our population. So with Within the FDA, there are multiple divisions. The divisions in regulatory affairs as it relates to pharmaceutical, drugs, biologics, those two divisions are going to be CBER and CDER. CBER is the Center for Biologics Evaluation Research and CDER is the Center for Drug Evaluation Research. So in general, when you're working on any sort of biologic, a lot of cell therapy products or regenerative medicine go through the CBER division. Whereas something like Advil, and I feel like I use Advil as the number one example for literally everything, but that would go to CDER. CDER does evaluate some biologics, and if you go on the FDA's website, I'll put a link in the description box, but if you go on the FDA's website, you'll be able to see what division within CDER evaluates certain biologics. And this transition just happened, I believe, in 2019 or 2020, and what I've personally seen is CBER is focusing a lot on like vaccines and um, really complex biologics, such as regenerative medicine or cellular therapy. So now that we've kind of broken down the FDA, who they are and what they do, and the different divisions as it relates to pharmaceutical drug products and what division you would go to, whether it's a drug or a biologic, let's talk a little bit about the actual applications. There are many applications within the FDA, but the ones that pertain to my day-to-day -day and what I do and what a lot of you are interested in are IND. That's the first one we'll start with. And IND stands for an Investigational New Drug Application. That's the starting point. That's essentially where every sponsor, what we call sponsors are pharmaceutical companies, every sponsor starts at that stage, the IND stage. And then after you've submitted your IND and you've done all your clinical research to prove that your drug is safe, it's tolerable, and it's most importantly effective, you then move on to apply for approval. And depending on what your drug is, whether it's an actual drug like Advil, that would go to C and it would follow the NDA route, which stands for New Drug Application. If it's a biologic, it would follow the CBER route and it would go as a Biologics License Application, also known as a BLA. So those are two of the approval applications. After you've already had your approval and you wanna change something on your label or your dosage form or your manufacturing process, we move on to what is called a supplemental application. Now, if you're already following following the NDA route, you would file an SNDA, a Supplemental New Drug Application. And if you are already approved for a BLA and you wanted to change the dosage form or the manufacturing or whatever qualifies, and I'll put a lot of this information in the description box because the FDA has a lot of guidances that you can read to kind of further understand 
understand what I'm talking about. But if you already had a BLA that was approved and you want to change something in the label or you want to market a new dosage or new strength, you would file a supplemental biologics license application. A lot of times people file supplements when they're changing the indication. So when they already know that the drug is effective in one indication and in their studies they saw that it was also effective in another indication, they may take that supplemental route. There's no need really to go and start all over again unless in conversations with the FDA they've told you that you need to conduct additional studies to support that new indication that you're exploring. Now the last and final application is actually called OTC. It's an over-the-counter application. I'm gonna be really honest with you guys, I haven't worked that much with over-the-counter products. My main areas have always been hematology, oncology, cellular therapy, regenerative medicine, some general medicine product, but I, I don't know that much about over-the-counter and I honestly don't know that much about generics as well. I've just really started exploring the generic pathway. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about are the various regulatory pathways for different products. And I'm gonna keep it really simple because I think understanding these three pathways can get very confusing. But if you do wanna learn more, I definitely suggest you Google them. You will hear about them if you work any regulatory affairs job, especially from a strategic perspective. If you work at a CRO, you'll hear a lot of these different pathways from your clients and you might have to advise your clients on which pathway makes the most sense based on the data that they have available. So the first one is a 505B1 pathway and that's the most common. That's where sponsors or pharmaceutical companies will conduct the studies themselves to ensure that their products are safe and they're effective, they're tolerable. Sometimes 505B1 products are seen as very risky because a lot of the times we think that all these pharmaceutical companies that are developing hundreds of millions of drugs are gonna receive FDA approval, but a lot of times most drugs don't make it past phase one, some drugs don't make it past phase two, and there's a very, very small percentage of products that make it to phase three and then approval. So going the 505B1 pathway is very risky for small companies because if that product isn't effective or it's not safe and it doesn't make it to marketing, you put all that money into developing a product that kind of fizzles out at the end and that's how a lot of pharma companies you know, pop up and then five or 10 years later you don't hear about them because their product never made it past that final stage. But yeah, the 505B1 pathway is the most traditional. 505B2 is kind of a mixture between the 505B1 and 505J, which I'll talk about next. But essentially it's a hybrid between the two of them. And what the 505B2 does is it allows sponsors or pharmaceutical companies to use public data instead of conducting their own clinical trials. Then again, it's not a generic. And finally, we have the 505J pathway. Now in the beginning of this video, I talked about an NDA, a new drug application. So under the 505J pathway, you're gonna have an ANDA, an abbreviated new drug application, or something people like to call a petitioned ANDA, which is a petitioned abbreviated new drug application. I'm not gonna get too much into the petitioned ANDA because I haven't really worked that much with them, and I've only worked on one ANDA. I'm still learning a lot about the 505J pathway, and as I learn, I'll share more with you guys. But for the purpose of this video, basically, an ANDA is just a generic. When you go to the pharmacy and you're about to pick up your medication or you give your pharmacist or your pharmacy technician your script and they're typing it in the computer and they ask you, are you okay with the generic? A lot of times generic products are a lot cheaper and they're a lot cheaper because they cost a lot less to develop than the actual new drug application. The qualifications are the two main or the most important things in qualifying for the 505J pathway for a generic and ANDA is that your product meets the bioequivalence, AUC, area under the curve, and CMAX to the drug that it's referencing. So that's the most important part of qualifying for an ANDA. And sometimes when people don't meet those bioequivalent markers, when they do PK studies for their drug product, they might try and go the 505B2 pathway. It's a lot. And I think that's part of what makes regulatory affairs strategy so interesting is because you have to spend a lot of time strategizing on what makes the most sense. And sometimes when you're in regulatory, you'll hear people talk a lot about storytelling. What story are we trying to tell? What are we trying to get the FDA to understand based on what we see. So that I think is part of what makes regulatory strategy so great. And then in me just explaining to you guys these different applications, what they mean, as well as what these different regulatory pathways are and what qualifies people to pursue them. I think, you know, that's part of what makes regulatory so great. I know this video was long, but I hope it was really helpful. And if you have any questions, don't feel afraid to put them down in the comments below. I hope you guys will come back for my next Regulatory Affairs Explained video. 
video. And until then, thanks so much for watching, guys. Bye.